Father, we come before you this morning so thankful that you will hold us fast. Our faith and our trust is in you and in your staying power. We thank you for saving us and we thank you for preserving us. We, we find great joy to be able to come before you as your church and to pour out our hearts corporately, giving you thanks for the fact that we could never have saved ourselves. And if, even if you had saved us and left us in responsibility and in, in control of our own salvation, we would have lost it long ago. The fact that we are in you is because of you. The fact that we have remained in you is because of you. And you get all glory from the beginning through the middle and to the end of, of our salvation. So as your people, as the redeemed who've been saved by your grace, we, we cry out, we just long for you to be magnified. Let all who love the Lord say, let the Lord be magnified. And this is our cry this morning, Lord, and we turn our attention to your word and we turn our attention to the gospel of Mark. We, I personally just find such great encouragement being able to come to you, Lord Jesus, the very subject of this book. The focus of this biography of your earthly life with emphasis on the fact that you are the Son of God and it brings me no small encouragement to be able to come to you and ask for help. And ask for help that I would make Mark 1 clear the way that I ought to. I pray that its truth would rest with clarity in our hearts and minds and I then turn that you would ask all of us as we listen, as we hear, and as we sit under the book of Mark, that you would quicken us, that you would impress upon us the reality of these truths, and that we wouldn't just be impressed by learning new things or having our minds stretched with new thoughts. I, I beg, Lord, that we would not rest until we find these truths living and vibrant in our lives. I pray that we would not rest until we see our lives conform to what we learn in this book. I pray this morning that you would prepare us for the rest of the book of Mark by tilling up our soil of our heart and softening us, producing more and more brokenness, that we might continue to live in a lifestyle of repentance. And even as Pastor Matt already mentioned, if there are any here this morning, as no doubt there are, Perhaps those who may be even singing that last, last song are wondering, are you holding them fast? Maybe for them this morning, that the beginning of the Gospel of Mark might, might be the beginning of eternal life. And so, Lord, stir up our hearts and till up the soil so that we would embrace the truths of Mark, that we would embrace your Son, and that we would follow him along the way. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, amen. You may be seated. Well, it brings me great joy to be able to say, grab your Bibles and open up to the book of Mark. And for the fourth time, we're going to read it, but this time, we're going to stay here. Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. And as you're turning there, I will say it's, it was very tempting. I kind of wanted to do a part two on Isaiah because there's so much more that I wanted to say, but... Somewhere, even undisciplined guys have to use some sort of self-control, so here we are. Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. That's our text this morning. Lord willing, we'll be able to look at all of this because of the ground that we've done the last two weeks in these Old Testament texts. So let's read together chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Mark writes, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea was going out to him, and all the people of Jerusalem 
And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist. And his diet was locusts and wild honey. And he was preaching and saying, After me, one is coming who is mightier than I. And I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Mark chapter 1 verse 1 could effectively be a title for the entire book. It really is kind of a unique beginning to a gospel. It's nothing like you see in Matthew or Luke or John. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And the title functions virtually as the thesis for the book. This is the gospel of Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ. It's not a last name. It's the name or the label Messiah. He is the anointed one. Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. And his point is that the reader must know that Jesus the Christ is the Son of God. It's a unique emphasis. Now, I mentioned to you several weeks ago, uh, Matthew's emphasis is that Jesus is the King of Israel. And so it's appropriate he begins with a genealogy, going back through David all the way to Abraham, the father of the Jews, to David, the King of the Jews. Luke's emphasis is that Jesus is the Son of Man. And appropriately, he begins with a genealogy, going all the way back to Adam. And John's emphasis is that Jesus is the Messiah. And so appropriately, a divine figure such as the Messiah begins with John 1, basically a, a rewrite of Genesis 1, the creative act of God, through this person who is called the Word, the expressive power of the Father, who is the second person of the Trinity. And here, Mark begins his gospel just stating, hey, this is the gospel. And what's amazing about that is that this is the only gospel that begins its gospel with the word gospel. In fact, it's the only gospel that actually claims to be the gospel. Um, other gospels, Matthew uses the word. Um, the others don't. Mark uses it throughout um, about eight times. But it's interesting that he just says, look, here's the beginning of the gospel. It's just the beginning because it's just how it got started. But to understand why it's only the beginning, we need to understand what the word gospel means. What, what is gospel? It's a, it's a profound word, and of course, in our gospel-centered um, American Christianity, gospel can mean many different things. Sometimes it just means we take our favorite truths and we make that central, and that would be the worst form of gospel, a pet theology, if you will. And that's never robust enough to actually account for what the Bible reveals about the gospel. But I want to start with just the word itself, euangelion in the Greek. What would that word have meant to a pagan? You know, it's interesting. It's a, it's a very common word in the, in the first century culture. And I came across a, a description of how this word was really a technical term. And, and what, what's fascinating about this is that the secular use of the word gospel and the, the, the scriptural use of the word gospel are quite similar, very similar. Listen to this description of the, the secular notion of the word gospel. Gospel is a technical term for news of victory. The messenger appears, raises his right hand in greeting, and calls out with a loud voice, Greetings, we won! By his appearance, it is known already that he brings good news. His face shines, his spear is de decked with laurel, his head is crowned, he swings a branch of palms, joy fills the city, and glad tidings are offered. The temples are garland, and um, crowns are put on for the sacrifices, and the one to whom the message is owed the honor is given a wreath. It's interesting, I came across an account of a herald who was bringing good news, and just as that account describes, as it often is, so often... It's a good news about a victory, about dominance, and about a, a victory of our king over some other enemy. And here's the example of one named Philippides. You probably have never heard the name Philippides, but you've probably heard the race that he ran. He ran the first marathon. Uh, literally, it was a battle at the town called Marathon, about 25 miles from Athens. That's right. I apologize to all you marathon runners who ran the full 26.2 
Now you'll be bitter if you ever run one. Why are we running this extra 1.2? I don't know. But anyway, he ran 25 miles from Marathon to Athens, and he gets to Athens, and he declares, Rejoice, we are victors. And the account says, saying this, he died together with the announcement and breathed out his life together with the greeting. After running 25 miles, after winning the battle, he shows up in Athens to make that proclamation of good news. We won. We defeated the enemy. And then died in the process. As you know, in, in the Greco-Roman era, there was such a thing called the Caesar cult. The worship of Caesar as God. And it's interesting that um, this term would have often been used of Caesar. Caesar, uh, Oct Emperor Octavian, who became Caesar Augustus, um, would have been Caesar even before uh, the gospel of the Old Testament was fulfilled. So it's interesting how there's even a copycat function in Caesar worship, copying the reality of what was revealed in the Old Testament about a coming king. But listen to this description of the, still again, the secular term or the pagan term, good news. And this is what they would have viewed good news as in light of their view of the emperor being God. The emperor unites the divine man, fortune, fate, and salvation in his own person. This is what gives the gospel its significance and power. And in case you, I haven't said it enough, I'm, again, I'm still talking about the secular term gospel. I don't believe this. <laughs> this is what they would have viewed about Caesar. The ruler is divine by nature. His power extends to men, to animals, to the earth, and to the sea. Nature belongs to him. Wind and waves are subject to him. He works miracles and heals men. He's the savior of the world who also redeems individuals from their difficulty. Fortune and fate is linked up with his person. He is himself, fortune. He has appeared on earth as a deity in human form. He is the protective God of the state. His appearance is the cause of good fortune to the whole kingdom. Extraordinary signs accompany the course of his life. They proclaim the birth of the ruler of the world. A comet appears at his ascension, and at his death, signs in heaven declare his assumption into the ranks of the gods. Because the emperor is more than a common man, his ordinances are glad messages, and his commands are sacred writings. Whatever he says is a divine act and implies good and salvation for men. He proclaims good tidings through his appearance, and these good tidings speak of him. In case that sounds like a little bit of an exaggeration. How about this example, which is explicitly ascribed to Octavian or Augustus? It's said that uh, in a calendar inscription dating back to 9 BC, found in Priene in Asia Minor, the inscription says this, The birthday of the God was for the world the beginning of joyful tidings, which have been proclaimed on his account. What a profound use of the word euangelion, gospel. Good news, Rome. We've got a Caesar. Caesar was born. And so, the birth of Caesar, which was viewed as the arrival of a God-man to deliver Rome, is good news. That's how the term was used in secular Greek. For the Jews, of course, their notion of gospel predates Caesar. The Hebrew scriptures um, talk about gospel quite often and very, very regularly. It's, um, it's, it's interesting, if you look at several examples in the Old Testament, you'll notice that what's common is, it's quite common to, for the gospel to be the news that God has won or that there's been victory and that there's then a dawning of a new age. Let me show you a few examples. If you want to just listen, that's fine, because I'm going I'm to move pretty quickly through a few sample passages talking about the word gospel. But if you want to turn, you can and turn and look at me at these passages with me. First of all, look at 1 Samuel 31. 1 Samuel 31, verse 9. Here's an example of, of the, in the uh, Hebrew Old Testament, uh, the word gospel. 
This is talking about um, the battle here with Saul uh, in verse 8. It says that when it came out on the next day when the Philistines came to strip the slain, that they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. They cut off his head and stripped off his weapons and sent them throughout the land of the Philistines to carry the good news to the house of their idols and to the people. It's interesting the word good news is used particularly when, the, when Saul, their enemy, has been defeated. And so now that becomes good news for Philistia. We've defeated the foreign king. The enemy has been put down. Listen to 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 10. When one told me, saying, this is David speaking, when, when someone told me, saying, behold, Saul is dead, and he thought he was bringing good news. I, see, I seized him and, and killed him in Ziklag, which was the reward I gave him for his news. And so this is a, uh, it's interesting that it was supposed that David would hear, this is good news that Saul is dead because it was the de death of his enemy. Again, in 2 Samuel, let's look at chapter 18, verses 19 to 20. Here's another example where As a result of the battle, they are hearing that uh, Absalom has died, and so they're taking the news to the king. Now, of course, Absalom is the king's son, but his men are thinking, surely this is good news. And so look at how the word gospel is used here in verse 19. Then Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, said, please let me run and bring the, the king news that the Lord has freed him from the hand of his enemies. But Joab said to him, You are not the man to carry the good news this day, but you shall carry news another day. However, you shall carry no news today, because the king's son is dead. And then you skip down to verse 24. David's sitting between the gates, and the watchman went up to the roof of the gate by the wall, and he raised his eyes and looked out, and behold, a man was running by himself. The watchman called and told the king. The king said, If he is by himself there, uh, then there is good news in his mouth. And he came nearer and nearer. Then the watchman saw another man running. And the watchman said to the gatekeeper and said, Behold, there's another man running by himself. And the king said, This one is also bringing good news. The watchman said, I think the running of the first is the running like uh, the running of Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok. And the king said, This man comes with good news. And he just, it just keeps using the word good news, anticipating good news of the defeat of an enemy. Ahimaaz called out to the king and said, All is well. And he prostrated himself before the king with his face to the ground. And he said, Blessed is the Lord your God who has delivered up the men who lifted up their hands against the Lord. And the king said, Is it well with the young man Absalom? Joab sent the servant, uh, sorry, Ahimaaz answered, When Job sent the king's servant, uh, your servant, I saw a great tumult, but I did not know what it was. The king said, Turn aside and stand here. And so he turned aside and stood still. But behold, the Cushite arrived, and the Cushite said, Let my lord the king receive good news. For the Lord has freed you this day from the hand of all of those who rose up against you. And then, of course, the king goes on to ask about Absalom, his son, who was the leader of the coup against David. So it becomes absolutely bitter for David because his son dies in unbelief. But it's interesting how typical it is that this word good news is used when there has been defeat of the enemy. Look at a few more examples, particularly that are going to connect to messianic prophecy. And I'm just going to limit to a few examples in Isaiah. Look at Isaiah chapter 40. This is where we were uh, in our last exposition. Isaiah 40 is actually a passage that's quoted by Mark in verse 3. But particularly, he quotes Isaiah 40, verse 3, but I want to look at Isaiah 40, verse 9, and you'll remember we looked at this together. Isaiah 40, verse 9, Isaiah writes, Get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, Here is your God. So you take the, the typical meaning of gospel, victory of a king over one's enemy, the anticipation of the seed promise, which we talked about back in, ex in the Exodus expositions, the seed is going to come who's going to establish animosity between Satan and man. And he's going to reverse the curse. And he's going to crush the head of the enemy, Satan. Satan. 
And now you take all of that with the term gospel, and you go to Isaiah 40, verse 9, and it says, good news, God is coming. God's coming. God's going to come. He's going to defeat all the enemies. He's going to reverse the curse. He's going to redeem his people. He's going to provide them rest. This is a profound, profound moment in redemptive history to be able to say, good news, good news, God is coming. Look at chapter 52, Isaiah 52, verse 7. Isaiah says, How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. I mean, the anticipation of this promise is when God is reigning from Zion and the people are enjoying happiness and peace. Everything's been restored to the way that it ought to be. Rest, the way it was on day seven. This is cosmic, global restoration. Verse 8, listen, your watchmen, lift up their, your, their voices. They shout joyfully together. They will see with their own eyes when the Lord restores Zion. Break forth, shout joyfully together, you waste places of Jerusalem. The Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm in sight of all his nations that all the ends of the earth may see the salvation of our God. He flexes his muscle. It's on behalf of his people. It's against all of his enemies. That is good news. That's gospel right there. Give me one more. Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, verse 1. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me. Yahweh God has anointed this divine speaker, this Messiah who is speaking in Isaiah 61. And if we had time, we could connect it to Isaiah 11 because this root of Jesse, the seed of David, is the one who will have the Holy Spirit in this fashion. But look at what he says here. The Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to captives and, to, and, and freedom to prisoners. This is gospel. This is gospel when God comes to earth to rule and reign in human form. Good news. Now, go back to Mark. And we are sitting in a good situation here because we have already done so much work on these Old Testament texts that are quoted in verse 2 and 3 that you can now appreciate what Mark is doing. I only need to make one more comment before we connect verse 1 to verses 2 and 3. Notice that verse 2 begins with the word as. As it is written. As it stands written. As it has been written in the prophet Isaiah or by the prophet Isaiah. And he makes a comparison so clearly what Mark is doing is he's quoting these passages. And again, to a quick review, these, this quotation here, it's, it's actually three quotations. He quotes from, first of all, Exodus 23, verse 20. Then he quotes Malachi 3, verse 1. Then he quotes Isaiah 40, verse 3. And he kind of creates a mashup. He just kind of compiles them all together into this one quote. And he says, just as it says in the Old, Old Testament like this, so that proves my point. That's the point of why you would begin a quote with just as. Just as it says in the scriptures. But now the question comes, is this proving the point of what he's getting to in verses 4 to 8? Or is this proving the point of what he just said in verse 1? And that's really the question here. And I think it's best. Several old, old uh, translators have taken it with verse 1, and that certainly is preferable. Um, men like Luther and Tyndale, and you can even see that in the Tyndale uh, influence through the King James uh, most of those translations, they'll put a comma at the end of verse 1, they'll put a period at the end of verse 3, and they'll, they'll show that what Mark is doing is Mark is proving his thesis of the whole gospel on these quotes. What that means is these quotes are actually driving the entire gospel, not just verses 4 through 8. And some people have said, no, it's, it's just exclusively driving verse 4 through 8 because there's so much in those quotes about a precursor, a forerunner of of the Messiah, namely John the Baptist. And that's true. John the Baptist is in two of those three quotes, but not all of them. 
First of all, the word just as is regularly compares something that was previously said. It can, it can be forward pointing, but it, it, it require, usually it requires some extra verbiage that's not here. The most simple way to take this is as a comparison, as proving the point that he made in verse 1. This is the gospel. Good news. Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ, and he's the Son of God. He's arrived. Good news. Let me prove it to you. The Old Testament said so. And secondly, it's also true that it would be difficult for this to be more myopic and only pointing to John the Baptist when he quotes from three texts and only two of the three actually have any prophecy that could even remotely be allusion to John the Baptist. No, this is a profound moment. We have an inspired account of somebody writing in the first century, writing, guided by God, and he's able to say, Listen, Israel, listen, Rome, listen, world. Let me prove something to you. He does not say, Jesus came and I start with him so that now I can go back and read in the Old Testament and find stuff that you couldn't have seen there before he got here. He says, Jesus is the Son of God. Let me prove it to you. The Bible said so. He's profoundly reading from left to right. He's profoundly letting the Old Testament speak. He's profoundly boasting in the clarity of the Old Testament to say you do not have to read the Old Testament through the lens of Christ. You just need to read the Old Testament and it's so clear that you can't help but recognize Christ. I mean, the idea that we have to read the Old Testament through the lens of Christ to figure out what God was trying to say as if there's some sort of divinely intended meaning that's different than the human author's intended meaning, that's an insult to God's ability to speak. And let's just be honest, if that were the way we have to read our Bibles, I could easily, just as easily prove that Jesus is the Son of God from the Wall Street Journal. No, he's not reading something in that's not there. He's able to say, this is exactly what God said. Just as the Old Testament said, well, here he is. And then we think about all those prophecies that we've surveyed about the seed and about the meaning of Yahweh and then the angel of the Lord and showing up in the burning bush and saying, I will be the one. Divine person declaring he's going to fulfill the seed promise personally. The crushing of the head of the serpent, the crushing of the head of Moab, all of the prophecies of the seed being narrowed through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and then Judah and then to King David. And then all of those psalms. The Son of God coming to reign, Psalm 2. The Son of God who's going to rule as firstborn preeminent over all creation, Psalm 89. A divine individual who's sitting on a throne that David could actually say, God your God has anointed you with joy above your fellows. Two divine people in the same verse. One ruling on a throne who's anointed by another person who is that first God's God. The Lord said to my Lord, David said, sit at my right hand. So David can refer to God and say there's another person called Lord who is David's personal Lord that that God has then put on the throne. And then Isaiah with all of his prophecies about the servant and the seed and the necessity of this servant to come back and to rule and reign and suffer and take on a body and be mistreated and atone for sinners. And we haven't even touched the rest of the prophets. You just skip them all right up to Malachi and just ties the thread through that redemptive promise all the way through and says, he's here. He came. It's Jesus. Now, what we need to do this morning is we need to look at verses 4 through 8, and it might strike you as strange because it is a little abrupt. It's abrupt to think about this gospel of Jesus Christ, and there's no genealogy, there's no background, there's no birth. It just launches with John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness. But I can appreciate, it's not a, it might be stark, but it's actually not abrupt because you remember what the prophecies said. In verse 
Um, to B, he's quoting from Malachi, and he's talking about this messenger who will prepare the way of this divine person. Because remember Malachi 3? There's two messengers. There's a messenger in, com, coming in front of um, uh, another messenger who is the messenger of the covenant, who is Yahweh, who is the Lord in whom you would delight, who's coming into his temple. Well, that first messenger is right here, John the Baptist. Isaiah 40 Remember, it has good news about God coming to earth, and there's a messenger leading the way, preparing the way. And if you remember, it's like mountains being brought low, valleys being raised up, so that a highway can be, can, can be paved, and you can make easy access, so that God can come with ease. Now, he's not saying we need to help God get here because he can't get here. He's talking about the fact that when God comes, he's going to produce revival and he's going to turn hearts back to the covenant. And so to prepare the way for God to arrive in that context is, requires change of heart, requires holiness, requires devotion to the Old Testament, requires an obedient nation who fears the Lord. And that's the forerunner's job. So, enter stage left, John the Baptist. Verse 4. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, it's interesting, in this verse, we, we have a very simple statement, John appeared. You think, great, what's so simple about that? What's so important about that? Well, what's fascinating about the, the, the way Mark tells this story is, this story actually has no action sequence. I mean, one of the, one of the typical uh, parts of a good story is there's an action sequence. So this happens, then this happens, and this happens, and this happens, and this happens, and you have a flow in the story. This entire story hardly even deserves to be called a story. The entire narrative consists of one action and everything else is descriptive so that we can appreciate the significance of that action. It's a pretty remarkable story when you understand what Mark is doing. Here's your action sequence. John appeared. The end. John shows up. And everything else explains his ministry. It explains his arrival. There's no, this is not a sequence of action points saying this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. It's just simply, so John showed up, as you would expect from the Old Testament, and then explains why that is so significant and why that is so important. Uh, all I'll say about verse 4 is we're going we're to come back to verse 4 because it's the main point of this whole narrative. Um, Verse 4 is the main point. Verses 5 through 8 give the background to understand his ministry. But really, all that you need to know from verse 4 for now is that it, the idea is that Mark is pointing out with two, two ideas here. His ministry can be summed up in two actions, baptism and preaching. A good translation might even be John the Baptist, or John, appeared uh, baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance. Those are the two things he was doing, was baptizing and preaching. The rest of these verses explain his ministry. So his ministry is fundamentally a ministry of repentance. This is critical. If you get nothing out of this text, get this. John's ministry was one of repentance. And if you miss repentance, it does not matter how much you know about Christ. It does not matter if you memorize the entire book of the Gospel of Mark. It does not matter how much you know or how long you've been involved in the church. It does not matter what your life looks like. If you do not repent, you are not following Christ in the way. This is not optional. This is the thrust of his entire ministry, preaching repentance, baptizing for the sake of repentance. That's it. Well, let's look at what he says about this ministry, starting in verse 5. This, John's ministry of repentance was, first of all, was prominent. Notice the whole country was going out to him, all the Jerusalemites. It's just kind of a similar, quicker way to say it. They're being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. I mean, this is a prominent ministry. It's not only all Judea. You have, the, you have, the, you have Jerusalem making the trek out there. I mean, J the Jordan River is becoming a weekend destination. People are thronging out there to see what is going on. Everybody know, know, knows about it. Everybody knows about John the Baptist. Everybody knows about his ministry. 
Some are coming because of curiosity, no doubt. Some are coming because of hostility, no doubt. And some are coming to be baptized. And some of those who are being baptized are sincere, no doubt. And some of those who are being baptized are insincere, no doubt. But everybody's going out there. The wilderness of verse 4 is profound. John Baptizing in the wilderness, now in verse 5, he's, go, every, he's, he's out in the, in the wilderness, particularly at the Jordan River, and people are going out there into the wilderness to the Jordan River. The wilderness, according to Jeremiah 2, was a honeymoon for the people of God. They left Egypt, they left enslavement, and they, their, their hearts were devoted to the Lord, Jeremiah 2 says, in the wilderness. It was the initial stages of their relationship with God. It was, a test, it was a period of testing, a t- period of privation. The Lord was teaching them to rely on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, Deuteronomy 8 says. And so here we are, and things are coming full circle. John the Baptist is out in the wilderness, and he's calling people to repent out there. And William Lane is very helpful in explaining the connection between the wilderness and John's ministry of repentance, his, the, the, the meaning of his baptism. He says this, The same correlation should be seen between baptism and the wilderness. The summons to be baptized in the Jordan meant that Israel must come once more to the wilderness. As Israel long ago had been separated from Egypt by a pilgrimage through the waters of the Red Sea, the nation is exhorted again to experience separation. The people are called to a second exodus in preparation for a new covenant with God. But John's call to repentance and his baptism are in are intelligible as aspects of the prophetic tradition which expects the final salvation of God to be unveiled in the wilderness. And think about this. John's calling them out to the Jordan River. The Jordan River. I mean, this is evoking pictures of the ministry of Elijah and the foreigner who has the the gumption to go to Elijah with leprosy, Naaman. And he says, go wash in the Jordan River. I mean, washing in the Jordan River, being baptized in the Jordan River, that has connotations of uncleanliness having to do with leprosy, uncleanliness having to do with Gentiles. Even the significance of water baptism should not be lost on us. Of course, we cannot import Christian baptism into John's ministry, but there was a precedent The Babylonian Talmud actually describes that for a convert to become a proselyte to Judaism, a Gentile who says, I'm going to become a Jew, part of the Jewish nation, three things were necessary. Circumcision, baptism by immersion, and sprinkling with blood. The association of baptism has to do with unclean, guilty, vile, despised before the Lord. So here he is ministering in the wilderness, and people are coming out. Verse 6 explains that his ministry of repentance was also prophetic. Look at verse 6. John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist, and his diet was locusts and wild honey. Now, you might think that's a strange verse. It is kind of a strange verse. You think, well, that's strange. Why, why is that there? I mean, like, so we can get, make our uh, comic book version of the gospel a little bit better. You know, the character of John the Baptist looks a little appropriate. We get the right attire and the right diet, the right cuisine. Well, it's actually very important. What Mark is describing here is the uniform of a prophet. Let me show you this in two places. Look at uh, 2 Kings chapter 1 for a second. We're going back to the, the ministry of Elijah because um, Elijah is the trendsetter here. He sets the uh, style. <laughs> so all the prophets who follow him are, stay in his, his mode here. Um, verse 1 tells us this is um, Moab has rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. Ahaziah was ill, and so he's sending uh, word to a false prophet to see if he's going to recover or not. And the angel of the Lord, verse 3, that's... Jesus Christ before he's Jesus. That's the second person of the Trinity. He says to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up and meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and say to them, Is it because there's no God in Israel that you're going to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? 
And so then these messengers leave, and basically Elijah inter- interferes, intercepts them, and sends them a message um, that uh, Ahaziah is certainly not going to recover. And so they go back, verse six, uh, or verse five, they go back to the king. He says, why are you back so quickly? They explain, hey, this, this, this guy like assaulted us basically and just gave us this message and sent, you back, sent us back to you. And so verse seven, he said to them, what kind of man was he who came up to meet you and spoke these words to you? And they answered him, he was a hairy man. And that's not saying he doesn't shave. It's just not talking about him personally. It's talking about his clothes. He was wearing a hairy robe. That's, that's, he was a hairy man. He was clothed in hair. And he wore a leather girdle around, around his loins. And uh, Ahaziah says, it's Elijah the Tishbite. A distinctive style for a distinctive man. And that becomes the style for prophets. Not because style matters, but because that's what marked them out, that there was a lineage and a legacy and a tradition that goes along with being a man of God. Now look at uh, Zechariah chapter 13. It's a fascinating prophecy about what's going to happen when false prophets are no longer tolerated. And this is just a fascinating reference. Um, Zechariah chapter 13, uh, and if you have more time, you can look at verses 1 through 6. But it's a prophecy of the day when Yahweh has come to earth and is reigning uh, through the Messiah. And notice that it says that in verse 3, if anyone still prophesies, um, then his father and mother who gave birth to him shall say to him, you shall not live for you have spoken falsely in the name of the Lord. And his father and mother who gave birth to him will pierce him through when he prophesies. This is, a, this is a prophecy that in the, when, when Yahweh is reigning from Zion, when the Messiah has, has established a kingdom, there's going to be so much righteousness in the land that anybody who prophesies falsely will be killed even by his own biological parents. So that a false prophet in those days is going to be, verse 4, afraid to even put on the hairy robe in order to deceive. False prophets are going to dress like true prophets. They're going to put on hairy robes and a leather belt. So this is clearly identifying John the Baptist as a true prophet. And then, of course, it relates that his his diet was locusts and wild honey because he lives in the wilderness. That's why he eats locusts. Why wild honey? Well, because he eats locusts. (laughs) Got to have something to get that down. (laughs) So here he is. He's eating. He's living in the wilderness. He's eating locusts and wild honey. He's wearing... He's 2.0 version, maybe, maybe, maybe a few years more in style, but he's just dressed clearly like a prophet. That's his function. God has sent him, and when he's preaching repentance, do not confuse. This is not John's message. This is God's message. John didn't come up with this. He's a pawn. He's a herald. He's a willing pawn. He's a herald heralding the message that the one coming after me is the one whom you should worship. And so he says that in verse 7 and 8. Not only is his ministry of repentance prominent and prophetic, it's also preparatory. And when we get to verse 7 and 8, it might be tempting to think this is the main point of the whole narrative. He was preaching and saying, After me, one is coming who is mightier than I. I'm not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. He's not even worthy to be a foot slave. He's not even worthy of, of waiting on this person who is the one to come. Uh, he, he is so much greater, so much mightier than he. John knows his role. He knows whom he is heralding for. He knows that the one coming after him is not merely a great man. He knows he is the great God. Verse 8 says, I baptize you with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And that certainly is the expectation of the Old Testament. Let me just give you a couple examples. Isaiah chapter 32 describes desolation in the land, and it describes it in very clear terms for verse after verse after verse. The land's going to be desolate. It's going to look this bad. It's going to get this horrible. It's just devastating. Until, verse 15, until the Spirit is poured out upon us from on high, and the wilderness becomes a fertile field, and the fertile field is considered as a forest. Peace from agricultural labors and rest from agricultural labors because of a reverse of the curse agriculturally will not happen until the Holy Spirit takes up residence in the nation corporately and the nation can fulfill those kind of conditions. 
Isaiah 44, verse 3, I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offering, that's literally the word seed, and my blessing on your descendants, and that's the plural word for all those who are associated with the singular seed. Isaiah 48, 16, come near to me, listen to this. From the first I have not spoken in secret. From the, last, uh, from the time it took place, I was there. Now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. Yahweh God's being referred to by this divine speaker who refers to his Father and the Spirit all in one. There's the Trinity right there. Isaiah 48, verse 16. The coming of the Son and the coming of the Spirit. Joel chapter 2, verse 29. Even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my Spirit in those days. And then he goes on with the prophecy of what's going to happen when the new covenant is fulfilled. John shows up and says, my ministry of repentance is preparatory for one coming after me who's greater than me. I'm baptizing in water because you must repent. He's baptizing in the Holy Spirit. This is the one who's going to bring corporate national repentance so that everyone who repents would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. This is profound. Verses 7 and 8 are not the main point. Mark writes verses 7 and 8 in the offhanded manner that's typical when a Greek narrator is giving you more background information to make sense of the action. The action is back in verse 4. John showed up. And his ministry was characterized by baptizing and preaching. It's not that, of course it's not that John's ministry is more important than Christ coming and baptizing in the Holy Spirit. The point is, is that that's the background for why John's arrival is so critical. Mark is, he's making it very clear for us. We could devote Sunday after Sunday after Sunday to the exposition of the book of Mark. And we could see story after story after story that prepare us and convince us that Jesus of Nazareth is indeed the Son of God. But it will benefit you nothing, nothing, without repentance. How many people in John the Baptist today, under his preaching, heard a message of repentance and never repented? How many people heard Jesus Christ's own preaching and never repented? We could hear the book of Mark and never repent. We must leave everything behind and follow Christ. Look at verse 4. He's baptizing in the wilderness. And he's preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. Without repentance, there's no forgiveness of sin because the blood of Christ cannot be applied to you because you don't need it if you don't repent. Unrepentant people have no need for atonement. Unrepentant people have no awareness of a guilt that they can't take care of. Unrepentant people... Their relationship with Christ is one of hostility. Repentance is such an important word. You probably know the word can mean to turn. And uh, one of the uh, visuals I used to do with my kids when they were even younger is we would just do like a a guy run in this direction. Well, maybe I'll do it up here. It's kind of hidden by the pulpit. He's running this direction and repentance is 180, going the other direction. That's, that's That's the visual we use for repentance. They're doing a 180. The Greek word here is metanoia, and it has the word, noia or nous has to do with mind, noia has to do with mindset, and meta would be a turning, a turning after or a change. And so it's a complete change of mindset, a complete change of heart. And there's an element where it's not quite precise to just say a turning of the life, because the turning of the life is the result of true repentance. True repentance is a change of heart, a change of mind, and the change of life flows out of a change of mind. Uh, the, ch- the change of mind is the cause. The change of life is the result. 
There must be a complete change of mind. There must be a complete alteration of one's inner soul, of the way we process things, the way we think about God and self and our world. Repentance is not just, I used to do this action and now I do this action. I used to do this thing and now I do this thing. As if John the Baptist came and said, God's coming, just do something different. John's saying, God's coming. He's coming after me. And without a complete change of heart, without a complete change of mind, you are not ready. He's making ready the way of the Lord. Not because Christ needs help, because the people need help. And this morning, we need help. We need help to be prepared for Christ. We're going to see story after story after story in this gospel of how difficult it is to follow Christ. Because those same prophecies that prophesied a peace in Zion and defeat of all enemies and a rule that's going to mean such blessing for all the subjects that everyone in the pagan nations are going to be jealous of how good it is for Israel in those days. That's true, but those same prophecies also said, and he's going to come and die in the place of transgressors. And he's going to offer up his body as a living sacrifice, a blood atonement. And when he does that, conditioned upon him offering himself as a burnt offering, he's going to see the seed corporately in his own day with his own eyes. After physical death, he's going to see his own seed on the earth. Those are all part of those prophecies. To follow Christ on the way to crucifixion, to follow Christ on the path that he lays out for everyone who would follow. To get on that path requires repentance. To stay on that path requires a lifestyle of repentance. We live in a tragic world full of religion that calls itself Christianity that appeals to worshipers for all sorts of motives that do not require true repentance. We have um, a message and a gospel that appeals to what doesn't require a repentance of my view of self or my self-love or my self-reliance at all. We have gospels that appeal to the desire to increase human flourishing, that appeal to the desire to gain a louder voice in the public square. We, we have a, a gospel that appeals to... Uh, Redeeming your finances and, and making a better marriage and enjoying life better and getting more fullness and more blessing and how to lead better, how to have better relationships and how Christianity can solve your loneliness and starvation and poverty and marriage problems and self-esteem and the list goes on and on and on. You know, I was thinking about the connection of what we looked at in Isaiah last two, two expositions ago and how the nation's going to go on the way and be restored back to a position of obedience. And John's coming to prepare the nation. We know that, of course, the nation didn't respond. But I was thinking about it, and I, I read a, a Jew named Jacob Neusner who talked about what's it going to look like, what's it going to take to get the Messiah to come back and fulfill these promises. And he says, you know when the Messiah's going to come back? The Messiah's going to come back when Israel chooses. All that's required is for the nation to repent. When the nation repents, then the Messiah is going to come back. He says this, Until Israel subjects itself to God's rule, the Jews will be subjugated to pagan domination. Since the condition of Israel governs, Israel itself holds the key to its own redemption. An act of humility and self-abnegation is what is required. And he takes that message of the Old Testament and in his view, rejecting Jesus outright, he's still waiting for a Messiah. And he says he's, that Messiah is going to come when the nation just pulls up its bootstraps and accomplishes repentance. That doesn't require repentance to have that view, because that appeals to man's self-will and man's self-reliance. Listen, repentance means a total transformation, a total change. The way I thought about God is radically altered. The way that I thought about self is radically altered. 
Repentance means I go from loving self to loving God. Repentance means I go from loving the world to loving God. It means I go from worshiping self to worshiping God. It means I go from self-will to pursuing God's will. It means I go from hating what God loves to hating what God hates. It means a transformation in the inner soul that goes from being consumed with what people think of me to being consumed with what do people think of God. This is just a radical alteration. John's preparing the nation for Christ because they weren't prepared. And I'm praying that verses 1 through 8 prepare us for the Gospel of Mark, unless we're not prepared. I just want to challenge you. Just thinking about what Pastor Matt said during the communion. Um, And I can do this being newer here. You can't probably aren't going to be tempted that I think that I might be thinking of you. I just know that in a room this size, and inevitably there's, there's souls who know a lot about Christ and even know on a page or on a quiz or on a test that he's the Son of God. But the better question is, have you repented? Have you had a radical change of heart a radical change of mind where your perspective was turned upside down and all the old values are now hated and all those old hostilities are now loved and cherished because without repentance there's no forgiveness of sin and without repentance there's no embracing of Christ without repentance there's no staying on the way with Christ and without no repentance you will never see the kingdom Father we're so thankful for this text because of its clarity and how it prepares us to benefit even more. Lord, we know that we are flawed through and through, and unless we are glorified, we desperately need this message. And so for our dear brothers and sisters, this is an encouraging challenge to consider, am I living a lifestyle of repentance? Am I continuing to confess my sin, and do I still flee sin? Am I amputating sin? Am I putting it off? The selfish ambition and the love of the world and the pride of life, is it, is it being radically amputated or is it prevailing? And so Lord, thank you for the clarity that there's no following you without a lifestyle of repentance. I believe we never get off repenting and because we never get off sinning in this life. But Lord, I also just want to ask for grace, even for those who are outside the family this morning. And I just pray that perhaps this is something that, um, maybe, the, maybe the part about Jesus was something they expected, maybe this part about repentance was not. I pray that you, by your spirit, you would graciously grant conviction. Because Lord, since John's day, and even before John's day, untold thousands and millions have heard the gospel and experienced remorse even remorse as significant as Judas thousands and millions have heard the gospel and responded with conviction even conviction as acute as Felix who sent Paul back to prison and how many thousands and millions have heard the gospel and responded with tears even tears as warm and wet as Esau's. But no place was found for repentance. And so I just pray, Lord, that you would indeed grant repentance to any who do not know you this morning. Pray that the beginning of Mark might be a beginning of spiritual life. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your ministry to us by the power of your spirit. And we just acknowledge corporately, Lord, we long to follow you And we want to aggressively repent of everything that would prevent us from following you. And as soon as we say that, we dare not pray that in a mindset that would rely on self to accomplish it because we will fail.
And so we repent of looking inward and looking toward ourselves, and we repent of that and look toward you. We look toward you in faith. We look toward you in confidence, knowing that you are the God who grants repentance, knowing that you are the God who saves and sustains and preserves. And we look to you, knowing that you're the God who gives the Spirit, who will enable us to obey and to walk in the path that you've called us to. And so we leave all of this at your feet this morning. We thank you again for your word. In your name we pray. Amen.